Putin up to a point has modeled himself on Stalin. In other ways, not at all. He has been careful not to associate himself too closely with Stalin. But on the other hand, he is fully prepared to admit that yes, Stalin was a great man. Under him, the Soviet Union reached the Russia, the Soviet Union reached the peak of its power. Really grateful and excited to be joined by Professor Martin von Krevel today, who supported me during my firing from Eton and is one of the world's leading military historians. He's recently published a book called I, Stalin, and I'll just read the prologue so you can get an idea of it. This book, Stalin explains, is not to glorify my own role in history, not inconsiderable as it may have been, but solely to help ensure as far as I can that memory of the way the first ever government of the proletariat, by the proletariat, for the proletariat, came about, overcame all obstacles and triumphed should not perish from the face of the earth. Now, right from the beginning there, this is outside of the fairly mainstream narrative regarding Stalin, which is that all he cared about was power. But the wording of the prologue there suggests that really fundamentally he is a Marxist. No question about it. Uh, apparently, Stalin started reading Karl Marx even while he was still a student at the seminary in Tiflis. So this must have been around uh, 1896, 97. Not only Marx, but also Engels, but not only Engels, but also Darwin and other uh, books, all of which had this in common that they were completely secular, even opposed to religion, and they were prohibited. Mm. They were prohibited by the uh, seminary authorities and students would be thrown out of the seminary just for reading them. And he was thrown out as well when he was 19 years old. So that must have been in 1898. Why do you think it is that Western scholars in traditional historiography on Stalin have approached the question of his intellectual development from the angle that he was only interested in power and power alone, and there wasn't much intellectual substance to his ideas? Well, it turned out that this was nonsense. Uh, he actually was interested in literature throughout his life. And as a young student, he even published some poems, mostly about nature and about love and how wonderful it was, uh, in all kinds of local Georgian newspapers. So nobody's born in one day, Stalin wasn't. And uh, there was nothing really very exceptional about him until the time when he started with some friends reading uh, unauthorized literature at the uh, seminary. And from that point on, of course, he was thrown out of the seminary. And from that point on, he really became interested in revolutionary uh, matters. Very hard to say when he really, uh, what really made him join the Marxist party. It was just one part of a, a wider intellectual approach. And why do you think Western scholars have been more focused on his interest in power rather than his intellectual roots in Marxism? Why downplay the Marxism? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. He obviously coped Marxism with secular literature in mm. general. A secular literature was banned at the seminary, and this, of course, increased the attraction. There was a cheap library nearby, so they used to borrow books. They used to smuggle them into the seminary and read them and discuss them together. And so this was just one uh, of the many approaches or threats that led into his mm. later existence. Uh, I think that Stalin didn't know what he wanted originally, like Marx himself. If you, I know something about Marx, because I taught him at university for some years, Marx was above all a rebel. He was originally a rebel without the cause. He did not really know what he was rebelling against and what he was rebelling for. The same thing with Stalin. Stalin was a rebel. He did not really know the direction, original direction in which he was going. And so he 
uh, he got all kinds of things. He read Russian literature, he read foreign literature, uh, including, for example, Flaubert. Flaubert was a favorite. Mm. Uh, strange for a man like Stalin. Uh, and at one point, after having been thrown out uh, of the seminary, he found work at the Rothschild Astronomical Observatory of all kinds in, uh, in Tiflis. And he just began to look for a cause. And he found it. He found it in the form of a the immense poverty into which he himself was born. He knew everything about being poor. And on the other hand, uh, in Georgian nationalism, which the Charles regime was trying to stamp out as much as it could. So he was both a, a rebel in both ways. Mm -hmm. A rebel against poverty, his own and that of his immediate uh, neighbors, and uh, a rebel against uh, nationalism, Russian nationalism. It's interesting here a bit about his origins there. Uh, tell me a bit about the qualities that you think enabled Stalin as someone just coming from a humble shoemaker's family to um, rise right to the top. What was it about him? Well, that is, again, a very difficult question, you see, because at the time the revolution went out, he was in exile, 2,000 miles east of Moscow, in the middle of Siberia. There was Stalin. He had been arrested several times. He escaped several times. At the time of the revolution, he was in Achik, of all places, and his role was so minor that he actually wrote to Lenin, in Switzerland, this was 1916. Have you forgotten me? I don't even get. Uh, I don't even get newspapers. I don't even get newspapers, uh, letters. Nobody remembers me. What's going on here? So this is Stalin about a year before the revolution. And then, as the revolution broke out, he traveled to Moscow. It was easy at that time. He joined. Uh, uh, the party and Lenin. And next thing we know, and he wrote and he organized and he uh, did pamphlets and all kinds of work for Lenin. And next thing we know, suddenly he has the office right next to Lenin in the palace that I had requisitioned in St. Petersburg. How come, how did this man who had been almost forgotten suddenly uh, found themselves as a kind of chief of staff for Lenin. There is no good answer to that question. Mm, interesting. I suppose the, the lust for power argument that some Western scholars have taken regarding him might go some way towards explaining it. He wasn't able to accept anything other than the highest position he could possibly find. Yes, but you know, any politician has a lust for power. And lust for power in itself, I think, is not enough. Mm. Uh, Stalin had some qualities which made him suitable for this kind of thing, obviously. His very catechistic style of, of writing, perhaps from his early seminarian training, do you think that made him an especially effective uh, communicator? He was able to manipulate people? Uh, you can exaggerate the role that a written word plays in, uh, in politics. Also, the role that the, uh, not only the written word, but the spoken word was not, not Stalin's uh, strength. Mm. Uh, other leaders came to power because of their rhetorical qualities. And that include, of course, his great, Stalin's great rival, Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler himself once said that Stalin, and I quote, Stalin owes nothing to uh, rhetoric. Mm. He governs the Soviet Union from his desk, unlike Hitler, who mm. owed everything to rhetoric, okay? He was a nobody in some ways who could speak as it themselves uh, described it in Mein Kampf. Stalin was, the, his great quality was as a committee man. Mm. That is where he was really the world champion. His ability 
to make fellow committee men, and later, of course, his own subordinates, do what he thought had to be done. He always spoke very, very quietly. He was very, very patient. He listened and did not comment. Okay? Did not comment. He just sat there and listened. And then when the impasse of the race was reached, which usually happens at the end of long meetings, there he was. And then he would uh, suddenly stand up and summarize everything, or do as if he was summarizing everything. This was his great strength, work in a committee. Another great strength was that he was able to remember faces and sayings. He never forgot anyone whom he met or to whom he had talked. He never forgot an injury. He never forgot a favor. He could meet somebody 20 years after he had first seen him and say, oh, you, I remember you, complete with names, dates, whatever it was, okay? It was very systematic, okay? Mm. He read at his best. He was reading as many as 50 reports a day. Okay, 50 reports, each of which goes down the, how many, God knows how many pages. Okay, enormous capacity for work, enormous appetite for work. Never, uh, never silent, never quiet, always doing what had to be done very systematically, one by one. Uh, a man like that uh, can rise to, to the top. Uh, maybe more, it, certainly in a very different way from Hitler's. Right? Hitler was the very opposite. Hitler was about as an agitator. Stalin was also an agitator, but in a much more calm way, much more subdued way. Okay? He was a good editor, he was a fairly good writer, but his real strength, as I said, was his work in committee, mm-hmm. which most people consider committees boring. Hitler hated them. He couldn't stand them, okay? He would lecture anybody whom he met. Stalin never lectured anybody, okay? Stalin only very rarely spoke uh, to large publics, okay? And when he spoke, he kept his uh, speeches very, very short maybe 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes, like the famous one on the 7th of October, 1941, 41, 7th of October, Russian calendar, uh, uh, November in uh, uh, November in the uh, ordinary calendar, okay? When it was a question of whether he should or should not leave Moscow in front of the uh, German steamroller, and he decided to stay, and the normal annual parade was held, and there was Stalin holding a lecture of just, or a speech of really only about 15 minutes, okay? Hitler would speak for hours. He enjoyed talking for, uh, listening to his own voice very much, and once he had finished, he would be drenched in sweat. He would leave each time uh, uh, each time he uh, held a speech, he would lose two or three kilograms. Wow. Stalin not. Okay? Stalin remained very, very cool, very, very calculated, very deliberate. Okay? Mm. Always planning ahead, no impulsive, always thinking at least several uh, weeks, months ahead, always looking for solutions to problems which others could not even see, okay? Very calm, in a certain way, terrifying, okay? Yeah. Precisely because he did not get excited, okay? Yeah. You never knew what was behind this calm demeanor. Yeah, there's a, a systematic efficiency you're describing there that is very well suited to the mass imposition of an ideology in the way that he did. Tell me a bit more about his role during the October Revolution. This is amazing. He had no, he wasn't there. He was 
almost 3,000 kilometers away from St. Petrograd. Okay, as he was called that morning. In exile, half forgotten. They couldn't even remember his name. Okay, Koba. Nobody knew who was Koba was. And then suddenly we find him in the office next to Lenin's in this St. Petersburg palace, which they had requisitioned. How he did it, nobody knows. You know, there is one book by a guy called Kotrick. He wrote, he, the book is divided into three parts. One, Stalin the revolutionary, the other is Stalin the dictator, and the third is Stalin the warlord and the statesman. Well, each of those is a thousand pages long, <laughs> 3,000 pages long, but he won't answer the question. Where did this guy suddenly come from? Mm. All we know is he had the office next to Lenin's, which means that all the mail addressed to Lenin or coming from Lenin uh, went through his hands. Mm. We know that he acted as Lenin's eyes and ears. And in, at the height of the Civil War, he was a uh, a kind of political fireman, okay? Whenever the battle against the whites was at its most extensive, there you could find uh, Stalin acting as a political commissar, as responsible for the political side of the war, making sure that orders were carried out, making sure that he would uh, that, that, that there would be no rebellions, making punishing commanders that uh, did not uh, do what they were supposed to do, and so on and so on. Uh, he was particularly important in two campaigns. One obviously was the one uh, at Stalingrad, or over Stalingrad, uh, at that uh, time it was still called Chechavin, uh, and it uh, unfolded in the autumn of 20, of 1920. The other one was uh, about half a year later, in the summer of 1921, against Poland. And in both cases, he did not command troop, but he uh, exercised general supervision, political supervision, in the name of Lenin himself. Again, how he did it, how he did it, how he got to that position, mm. Is a mystery. And indeed, at the end of 20, uh, 1923, Stalin was elevated by uh, Lenin, uh, was made into the Secretary General of the Communist Party. Okay? No greater, more important post. We don't really know what made Stalin choose him. There are tons and tons of material about it, but I have at least have not been able to find a good answer. Uh, nobody knows, no one knows. Mm. Obviously Lenin saw something in him that others uh, did not. Uh, interestingly, Stalin was one of the very few original Bolshevik leaders who had not attended university. Okay, he had attended a seminary, an orthodox seminary. Uh, almost all his fellow revolutionaries were better educated than he was. Okay, uh, were better speakers, were better you uh, were better at, at at argument in a way. Okay, he was just. A very calm, very deliberate, very purposeful uh, person. And ab above all, it sounds a revolutionary rather than an intellectual. He was interested in practical change and implementation. Yes and no. Trotsky, his great rival, who was, uh, of course, Jewish, uh, and who uh, was much better speaker, much better speaker than. Uh, Stalin always claimed that what really distinguished Stalin was the fact that other people uh, underestimated him. They didn't take him seriously. Here was this hick guy 
from uh, the provinces, from Georgia, with no university uh, education, with no really great speaking abilities, uh, always messing around until they out best anyone, anybody else. I think that is that is again an underestimate of Stalin. Hmm. He was very interested, like Napoleon, by the way, like Julius Caesar, like Hitler, uh, in history. And history was his favorite reading, but he also read uh, fiction, particularly, but by no means only Russian fiction. Okay, And uh, it's surprising how much uh, he knew and how many different kinds of interests he had. For example, when he died, he had a library of 20,000 volumes. Hitler only had about 6,000 uh, volumes as his library. But he didn't, he didn't trust it. Okay? He didn't trust it forward. He didn't clean himself on it. Uh, he was, if anything, a bit retired. Basically, he was a bit shy. Hmm. That if you had asked him, he would have said yes. Originally, at least, I was a bit shy. No wonder in front of all these guys, all of whom had, or many of whom, were much better educated than myself, almost all of whom came from a higher social class than myself. He was the son of a semi-literate cobbler, okay? Mm. Cobbler, uh, a drunk, okay? Whereas uh, many of his associates were bourgeois, some were very rich, like Chicharim, okay? The, the first the Bolshevik foreign bank commissar, okay? Who, who is this guy? Who is this guy? Well, he proved that he was more than a match for all of them, each one of them, and even for all of them combined. But he was, again, his ability to work in committee, to yeah. find support among his comrades in committee, to always, almost always have the last word. That was his great strength. There's a lot there about mysteries regarding his personality as he was rising to power. What about when he was actually ruling the USSR? What was his private life then? Uh, relatively little is known about it. And there was a funny incident uh, in 1950, the then North Korean dictator, uh, what was his name? And the, 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 uh, the grandfather of the present one, Okay, uh, visit in Moscow. And the North Korean delegation organized a meeting, a ball, a reception at the most uh, greatest hotel in Moscow. Now and then it's the Metropolitan. Uh, and uh, the invitation said, we hereby are happy to invite Mr. and Mrs. Stalin. They didn't know he was not married. Okay, <laughs> and then, and then, no, he was not married. He allowed very little publicity, publicity about his private life. We know that he got married when he was 20 or 21 years old. So that was about 1898, because there are some dispute about the exact year in which he was uh, born. Okay. Uh, to uh, uh, the daughter of a fellow revolutionary, but he was he, he was a revolutionary. He had the Tsar's police, the Ukhwana, on his heels. He couldn't stay at any one place for more than a few days, probably. So they spent very little time together. Uh, they had a son, Jakub, but he he was unable to spend time with or look after uh, his son. A year after the marriage or so, uh, his wife uh, uh, died. And he went from one exile to the other, which lasted basically until the end of the revolution, or at least until it had been established. Uh, and at that point, he remarried uh, again with a, uh, the, he married the daughter of Nadia, was her name, of a uh, fellow revolutionary. And he was her too. He had later had two children, a son 
and a daughter. Uh, she was a very good looking, uh, well educated, uh, but somewhat strange woman. Something was wrong with her mentally. No one knew what. Uh, Stalin at that time, uh, the Kremlin, although not yet a great dictator, did what he could for her. Okay, he brought physicians and uh, psychologists and psychiatrists from all over the world, both in, in Russia, out of world. He tried what he what he could for her. There was something wrong there. Okay? Now, of course, his enemies would say uh, to be married to Stalin would make anybody crazy. Well, maybe, <laughs> maybe yes, maybe not. And he was not the most delicate uh, of husbands. That is clear. Uh, there are all kinds of stories about the last banquet that she attended. She hated those banquets, but she was lead married to Stalin, so she had no choice from time to time. This was held in 1922 on the anniversary of the revolution. There was a banquet in the, uh, at the Stalin, uh, sorry, at the Kremlin, and he apparently, apparently uh, flicked a crust of bread in her direction. Or maybe, by another account, she flirted with some other woman. But anyhow, she left the banquet in the middle, and then next morning, she was found with a sh shots for the heart. She had committed suicide. Uh, and she left behind uh, two uh, little children. One was uh, Sergei. Uh, who later became an Air Force general and was the great disappointment of Stalin's life. And the other was Svetlana, who was his favorite daughter. And his favorite, she was very much like his mother. Mm. Uh, Stalin's father was an illiterate uh, cobbler. She was a servant woman, but apparently, apparently more ambitious than he was. And uh, he, uh, and she looked after his education, and he he was throughout his years in power, he was doing, making efforts to make her leave Georgia, where she continued to live, and go to uh, Moscow. But uh, she refused, okay? And in the end, she died, died in 1927, <laughs> sorry, 37. <laughs> and to the end, she maintained that it would have been better if uh, he had become a priest. Right. But she was ambitious on his uh, account. And it, it is at least possible that she paid for her ambition by uh, having affairs with one or more priests. Okay? She liked priests, and priests liked her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've, you've mentioned uh, Lenin there, and one way of looking at the relationship between Lenin and Stalin is that Lenin introduces some ideas like the Vanguard Party, for example, or the revolution in a non-Western industrialized power. These ideas deviate a bit from the classical canon of Marxism. And then Stalin takes it further. He's thinking about socialism in one country, Russian nationalism and excessive centralism, until there's not really much left of the original Marxism. It's been replaced by elements of the, the native Russian tradition. There are a couple of interesting developments that I think we should talk a bit more about. Uh, why did Stalin decide to collectivize agriculture? And what were the results? Well, one very important point, which is very relevant to what is happening in Russia right now under Putin, was Russia's backwardness. Russia was a backward country. It had been a backward country at least since the, the Renaissance, the 16th century. Okay? Everybody else looked back down on Russia. Okay. Russia was the place where almost the whole in the population consisted of illiterate peasants. That was even true in 1914. 80% of Russians could not read, let alone write. 
Stalin. And Stalin himself, on one occasion, told the party central committee that this backwardness had been Russia's great problem. It enabled everyone, but everyone to invade them and to build them, build them. It was beat them. It was so because there were no uh, natural borders. First came the Vikings in the 9th and 10th century. Then came the uh, German knights. Then came the Mongols. Then came the Turks. Then came the Poles. Then came the Swedes. Then came the French. Then came the Anglo-French in the Crimea. Then came the Germans twice in one century, 1914, 18, and 1945, 1 to 1945. Everybody considered it almost, I would say, his holy duty to invade Russia and turn, turn away uh, parts of it. Back in 1920, the height of the civil war, the Japanese, the Americans, the Brits, the Italians, the Greeks, the Greeks, for God's sake, so <laughs> they deserve to take away that this was the right time for opportunity to take away part of Russia and, of course, uh, 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 kill and destroy and rape on the way. Okay? Russia was a backward country. And the task that Lenin, above all, set himself when he said communism means socialism plus electricity. Okay, was to pull Russia out of this backwardness mm -hmm. by the by the hairs which he didn't have. Okay. By the way, did you ever hear how the Soviets could choose the leaders, the Russians? Alexander the Third was a big, big man, the child. Okay, and he uh, he was had uh, he was completely bored. Nicholas the Second was. Uh, had lots of hair. Yeah. Uh, Lenin was bored. Stalin had lots of hair. Khrushchev was bored. Brezhnev had lots of hair. And so, <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah, I don't know who is going to succeed Putin, but he's going to have hair. <laughs> I you <of> that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was a question of pulling up Russia. By, by the hairs almost, oh, by, by, like Baron by Midhausen, okay? And time was running out. In 1931, Lenin, uh, Stalin addressed the Politburo on this question. And he said in so many words, we have 10 years to catch up. Not often was any prophecy so acute, okay? 10 years later, Hitler's invasion by Barbosa. Okay, so they knew they were. How could they not know? Most of them had been exiled. Lenin had been exiled for, two, for 10 years. How could they not know that Russia was backward? That this backwardness was very much part of its uh, weakness. And it was not something new. Peter the Great knew it and tried to pull out that's why he set up St. Petersburg in order to set up a window to the West, as he called it, okay, to start modernizing Russia. Catherine the Great knew it, okay. Uh, every single uh, Russian, uh, Russian ruler since Peter the Great, at least actually even earlier, knew it, okay. And they all tried what they could to pull uh, uh, to pull Russia out of it, uh, its backwardness. And that was the problem, okay? The revolution having uh, established itself. What do we do in order to finally make a uh, uh, modern power out of Russia in the face of the entire capitalist world, which the way Moscow saw it was only preparing for the moment they could tear Russia uh, apart, as they had tried to do so often in the past. Now, these were the 1920s. Uh, Russia had no men left. Millions were 
killed in World War I and the, and the Civil War. Where was the manpower to come from? The answer, only from the farms. The farms, we had to get people, leave the farms, leave the countryside and move into the towns in order to work in industry. Millions of them, millions of them. How do you do that? You collectivize the farms. Mm. Why do you collectivize them? Because individual peasant holdings were much too small for mechanization. Okay, you couldn't have a situation where each uh, peasant would have his own field and his own tractor. And anyhow, they, unlike the Americans, they didn't have the money to buy a tractor, nor did they have the mental capabilities, the technical know-how know -how to maintain and operate a mechanized farm. So it was a question of moving as many people into the cities and into industry without uh, doing away with all agriculture together. Mm. There was simply no other choice. So that's what they did. And the sacrifice was unimaginable. Although in the book, you know, I used some figures that Stalin himself quotes, for which it turns out that between 1926 and 1933, I think it was, he said, he told the, the party uh, General Assembly that uh, population increased by 10.6%. Okay, population of the Soviet Union. This is interesting because I went back to the figures and I checked the United, the, the United States for the same period. And I was very much surprised to find that According to official American figures, the American's population during the same years, 1926 to 1937, increased by exactly 10.6%. Is that possible? Okay. Uh, I did not really, do not really have the figures. I read the books, but I do not really have access to the original sources. My feeling is that the figures of Stalin's victims have been exaggerated by the West. Very surprising to say that find both the United States and the Soviet Union increasing the population by exactly the same number, mm. <laughs> exactly the same period. Unless, you know, somebody, and I would not put it beyond Stalin, somebody has been playing with the figures. Yeah. That's also possible. Also possible. He was one of his other qualities that made him what he was, his ability to keep a secret. Right. He was not someone who, on the excitement of the moment, would reveal more than he wanted to reveal. Mm. He was very, very deliberate. It sounds like during his years in power then, his nationalism really emerged. So there's a mixture of, on the one hand, revolution and patriotism on the other. He felt that the interests of Russia were, were best served by revolutionary change. So thinking about his experience during the Great Patriotic War then, why do you think he became really convinced of the potential of that patriotic motif? What was in it for him? He's holding up the nation and its national community as the main source of hope for defeating the bourgeoisie. And he thinks that socialism combined with patriotism is the best way to do this? Apparently so. He himself came from a minority nation. And this shaped, to some extent at least, shaped his whole career. He was Lenin's expert on nationalities. Even before 1914, he went to Vienna, the center of the capital of a great uh, supranational empire, in order to study the nationality question and how the Austrians dealt with it. Okay, so this was very much on his mind from beginning to end. How to somehow combine nationalism with, uh, with Marxism. 
<laughs> Either way, you might say that was the was facing the same problem. And he apparently was aware that for all the enormous propaganda machine that he and others built up and put into operation, uh, nationalism was still there. And if you wanted to really to confront the Nazis, to find a way to his country's heart, heart mm. one that would make them stand up and fight. It was not Marxism, but uh, which really only, I would say, uh, caught on among the upper levels of the Communist Party, like the inner party of uh, George Orwell, 1984. Mm, yeah. But you had to turn towards nationalism and religion. And so, in 1943, after having persecuted the church, the Orthodox Church, uh, during most of his career, uh, he allowed churches to open, he allowed uh, uh, printing uh, houses, religious printing houses to open, he allowed uh, public prayers, and so on, and so on, and so on, because he was aware that this was the real nature of the uh, of the Russian people. By the way, this is still playing a role in the present conflict in Ukraine. Ukrainians are Catholics, but not in the East. The further East in Ukraine you go, the more you meet with Greek Orthodox, okay? And this is very much part of the present conflict. This tension between the, in Ukraine between the Catholic and the Orthodox uh, churches. Mm. Interesting to see it in that context. Stalin himself is so interesting to see in that context. Okay. Yep. Putin, up to a point, has modeled himself on Stalin. In other ways, not at all. Okay. For instance, when it comes to rehabilitating, uh, rehabilitating uh, the victims of Stalin and so on and so on, in, some, in other ways, not at all. But he has been careful not to associate himself too closely with Stalin. But on the other hand, he is fully prepared to admit that yes, Stalin was a great man. Under him, the Soviet Union reached. The Russia, the Soviet Union, which the peak of its power, yeah. okay? the peak of its power. Everybody was trembling in front of Russia and Stalin. Uh, and so he, uh, that's the way he treats Stalin. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you can't blame him for that. At least I don't think I can blame him for that. Recapping on what we've got so far then, before we get into some questions about the purge of the party and the army, we've got a few different threads. You've got Stalin's view of the state in the thought of Marx and Lenin, so centralised, very bureaucratic. He excels at all of this, especially the micromanagement of it. We've got, I suppose, going back to Jacobinism with the example of revolutionary patriotism, and this combines centralization elements of government by terror and patriotism then as you've stressed we've also got as a, a central part of marx's ideas not something that comes later from lenin a proletarian revolution in a backward country this is going to be important and then we've also got to put it bluntly a, a marxist nationalism and Stalin's emphasis on the power and utility of nationalism for revolutionary movement uh, stems from his Marxism. And then we've got his development under Lenin, uh, especially regarding his views on the question of nationalism. So considering all those different streams that go into making up Stalin's thought, tell me a bit about the purge of the party and the army. What do you think he is really aiming at there? Well, these were the mid 1930s, mid to late 1930s. There is something that almost all the authors that I've read overlook, the Spanish Civil War. Okay? The Spanish Civil War was lost by the government and by the left because of a fifth column. The expression itself was coined during the, the, the Spanish Civil War. Okay? Stalin realized that war was coming. 
He said so already in 1931, even before Hitler came to power. He said so because the way he saw it, the capitalist powers had vowed to destroy the world's only uh, socialist, communist uh, country. And they would launch a war one way or another, a war against the Soviet Union. The most important thing in any war, the way Stalin saw it, was the stability of the real. The stability of the real, the political reliability of the real, exactly that which the Spanish government during the Civil War did not have. Mm. So he said, up to assure himself of the stability of the real. That, I think, was his great objective. And it overrode everything else during those absolutely, absolutely terrible wars. And of, uh, yes, and of course, he also took the opportunity to get rid of anyone else who had crossed him in some way or who see, saw that uh, he saw them by the danger in any way. But basically, I think it was part of his uh, preparations for war. Now, it's often been said that he uh, destroyed the upper ranks of the military. And that, in a way, is true. So many of his most senior officers, commanders, were eliminated. Uh, and that, that is certainly true, and replaced by less experienced people. But you know, those people, those commanders who during the revolution and the civil war had been in their 40s were now in their 60s. Mm. And people in their 60s normally, although there are exceptions, are not suitable for fighting a war. By the way, this is a problem with NATO too at present, but let's forget about it. So yes, he did away with a lot of experienced officers, but on the other hand, he opened the way to some very, very talented, very young and very talented officers. Okay, people like Zhuko, people like Wokosovsky and, and others, okay, also Admiral Kuznetsov, a prime example, okay? By he removing the most senior officers, he uh, opened the way to less senior ones. Uh, and that is one reason why, uh, certainly during the second half of the war, which for the uh, Russians started in 1941, he had at his disposal a general staff, Stavka, in Russian, second to that, okay? Uh, his organization, his headquarters were at least as efficient as the American and Russian one, and certainly much better than the German ones, which the war, longer the war went on, the more problematic it became, okay? So he was able to, he had those people who, who served as the same role that he basically had fulfilled during World War One. Okay, mm. uh, whenever a great a critical battle was being planned, be it defensive or offensive, the Stavka would send out a very senior representative to uh, oversee the, uh, the that operation, and the worst. Important of them, of course, was Zhukov, who was really like Stalin himself in World War One, a kind of uh, mobile one man fire brigade. Mm. Uh, he made sure that the various commands, funds, armies, and so on would remain firmly under control and would do what had to be done. Uh, and not just go their own uh, various ways. Uh, and the system worked. The system worked. It was brutal, okay? There is a story about uh, Zhukov, uh, who allegedly, uh, each time a subordinate of his field would say, now, first of all, you guy, you put your subordinate, your second in command in your place, and second, you will shoot yourself, okay? 
I don't know whether that is true. Certainly, Zhukov could be brutal. But the situation was in 1941, 42, was absolutely desperate. Okay? With 60% uh, of Soviet industry having been overrun by the Germans, with evacuation of entire industries, with the deaths of millions and millions, nobody knows how many, destruction on a scale that never seen in history, not before, not after. There is a story about Eisenhower. You know, Eisenhower flew from Berlin to Moscow in June 1946. And in his memoirs, he noted that on the entire route, he did not see a single intact house. Okay? Wow. Over in Belarus and, uh, and, and Russia. But it was destruction on a, on 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 an unimaginable scale. Extreme situations demand extreme solutions. Mm. And Stalin, in my view, my guess, no one else could have done it. Okay? Mm. No one else had the stamina. No one else had the authority. No one else had the sheer capacity for doing work, okay, that he had. If necessary, you know, working for days and days and days, no stop, day and night. And it's this you cannot take away from him. My own guess would be that, uh, as, as you probably know, 80% of all German soldiers who were killed in World War II died at the hands of the Russians and the Soviet army. Yeah. 80%, okay? You could even go further and say that until June 1944, until the Normandy invasion, the Allies, the Western Allies, really did very, very little for Russia mm. okay, to win the war. There were some kind of uh, secondary front. First, North Africa. But North Africa, <laughs> Göring at Nuremberg called uh, North Africa a little safari, okay? And Romo had never had more than four or five German divisions at his disposal, although his share in the total German armor was higher than that, okay? because he, all his units were, were armored and mechanized. Mm. But the total number of German divisions that were used on the Soviet front was about 200. Okay, and later there was the same was true in about the Italian front. Okay, it was only after June 1944 that finally, with the war practically won, almost won, or whatever you want to call it, that the West really started helping. Yes, uh, they bombed. Yes, they provided Russia with uh, material, uh, primarily uh, armor, vehicles, boots, and. Uh, and, and, and food, okay? But by the best available uh, estimates, probably it only mounted to about four to eight percent of the total uh, Soviet uh, war effort. And it only started coming, really coming, because it had to make such a long war journey, because the arrangements had to be put in place. It really started arriving only in the early 1943, late 1942, 1943, at the time of the uh, Battle of Stalingrad. So you could, I think, make a case that if it had not been for Stalin and the Soviet Union, uh, Germany and the Western powers would have been fighting each other to the present day, yeah, to the present day. Uh, it was the Soviet Union which really tore the, the kishkes, as we say in Hebrew, the innards of, yeah. uh, out of the German Wehrmacht. And of course, it was the Soviet Union which occupied Berlin. Mm. Yeah. Now, this is making me wonder, thinking about the decisive intervention of, of Stalin and the Soviet Union. Um, tell me a bit more about why you think he signed the 1939 non-aggression pact with Hitler? And didn't he see this coming? 
did the war take him by surprise? You've said that he saw problems many, many steps ahead, far further than most people could. Yes. So of the 1930s, Stalin and Molotov, uh, his second in command, who later became his foreign minister, were very much aware of the German threat. How could they not be, given that Hitler had started all uh, yeah. out in Mein Kampf, okay? Throughout the 1930s, Molotov and uh, Litvinov, who was then a Jew, Jew, by the way, who was Stalin's uh, foreign minister, foreign commissar, tried to form some kind of front against Hitler. United Western Front, which would have been uh, meant as it was in World War I, uh, alliance between France, Britain, and uh, the Soviet Union. Litvinov went from one capital to another. He tried and tried and tried and tried. He was formed off time after time after time. Uh, finally, in 1939, this was in the spring of 1939, the Brits decided or agreed to send a representative to Moscow to talk seriously about an alliance. His name was Drex, Admiral Drex. No one had ever heard of Admiral Drex. No one was ever going to hear of him again. He did not even bother to take an aircraft to St. Petrograd, uh, to Leningrad or Moscow. No, he took a boat. And as a result, he arrived, I don't know how much, uh, how late, okay? And then when he finally arrived, it turned out he had no authority whatsoever. <laughs> he was only allowed to listen and report. Okay? So Stalin, this was May 1939, Stalin got to the conclusion, the right one in my view, that the West was not really interested in and allies with him. What the West really would have liked would be a war between Germany and the Soviet Union. Mm. And one, there was in 1941 when that war, when it was Germany in 1941, uh, sorry, when Hitler invaded the Soviet Union in June 1941, there was an American senator who said so explicitly what we really would have liked would be a nice war between Germany and the Soviet Union. See. Unfortunately, it's not going, it's not, this is not the case. And what was the name of that senator? Harry Truman. Hmm. Harry Truman himself, right? I mean, straight from the horse's mouth. The great obstacle was Poland. The Poles hated the Soviet Union even more than they hated Germany. And besides, they grossly overestimated themselves. When the war broke out, they told the Brits and the French, look, you look after yourself, we'll capture Berlin. Okay? The Poles had really a Napoleon complex. Okay? and following the victory over the Soviet Union in 1921, in which, by the way, as political commissar, Stalin was deeply involved. The Soviet Union did not have any common border with Germany. So in order to come to the help of Britain and France against Germany, they had to pass Poland to Poland. But the Brits and the French refused to press Poland into allowing such an advance, understandably so, okay? I can understand why the Poles didn't want the Russians. They were under Russian rule for over a century, from 1793 to uh, 1918 or, or, or 16, actually, right? And they didn't want any Russians in their country, but this made the alliance impossible. So Stalin had no choice. And no choice, he would have liked nothing better than a alliance in the thirties between himself and the rich and the French. It didn't work out, so he turned to the Germans. It was all worked out very, very quickly, a matter of about less than about six weeks, okay? Uh, about six weeks, and he made an disagreement which he thought that he that would postpone at least the coming war between Germany and the Soviet Union, which he did. 
it was the Poles who were really the obstacle. You can't blame them for that, but it was them who made such an alliance impossible. So when the when the German attack came, did it take Stalin by surprise, or do you think he was expecting it? Well, he was expecting war. He was planning for war. Yeah. My feeling is that if Hitler had not attacked, Stalin would have attacked him. And uh, very difficult to say when. He was certainly preparing for that, but he was preparing for offensive warfare, not defensive warfare. Yes, he was taken by surprise, not by the fact of war itself, but by the timing and the scale and the sheer chutzpah, you might almost say, the sheer uh, daring of the attack. Nothing like that had ever been shown, uh, existed in the history before that, before the war. Never anything like that since then. Take the current <laughs> invasion again, okay? By current estimates, the Russians are using about 100,000 troops in the Ukraine right at present. Uh, Hitler mobilized three and a half million troops. Okay, that would be almost four, almost almost 30 times as many. Okay, mm. unbelievable. Nothing like that has ever happened before. Nothing I'm sure you ever like that you ever happened again. This was something inconceivable. Okay, the sheer power of it, the sheer momentum of the German offensive. Years ago, I talked to a German officer. His name was Dr. Stahl, I suppose. He is long deceased. Uh, Dr. Stahl was in charge of the Military Geschichtliche uh, Institute in Freiburg, okay? And I used to work there. And one day we sat together and we had a glass of wine. And there is this one art guy getting maybe just a little bit excited by the wine and starting to talk about 1941. We marched all the way from Berlin to Moscow, 2,000 kilometers on foot. Okay, it was fantastic, like that. Okay, you can understand what he meant, okay? Mm. Such a thing, okay? This dwarfed even the Blitzkrieg of 1940 against France. That was nothing. Only about a, a million and a half men. And far fewer attention, far fewer everything. Okay? Nothing like the fury that Hitler really unleashed. And yes, I think it took Stalin by surprise. And yes, I think it took him a few, uh, some time to recover, maybe two weeks. Okay, but even if he had this, uh, even though in that period he did function, he did function. But two, it took him as far as the sources allowed me allowed us to, to see. He he was taken by surprise. He was uh, somewhat under the uh, under the, uh, stunned. Okay, by what was happened. Uh, who would it be? Yeah, I, the qualities that you outlined in Stalin earlier the cool headedness and the systematic planning were exactly the ones required to be able to mount a response to that. Most people would have been completely overwhelmed. Yes, I think so. I think so. And the situation remained desperate and actually became more and more desperate until about November, December, 1941. Okay, yeah. Nothing in history has ever equaled or probably will ever equal the German offensive against the Soviet Union. Right? There were other offensive later in the, in the, in the war, uh, probably Soviet ones, okay? But nothing with this kind of momentum. How important would you say that the, the Western land lease was then? Well, uh, we've discussed this before. No. Uh, yeah. I, is that the, diff the figures are very different depending on what you whom you believe. Uh, the f most reliable numbers that I've seen were between about four and eight yeah. percent of Soviet war effort, primarily foodstuffs, primarily leather for uh, boots, food, 
and only remotely, uh, long after that, uh, things like weapons and tanks, okay? Western tanks were not very well suited for the conditions of Russia uh, because they didn't have the tracks, the uh, white tracks, to cope with the terrain and the absence of roads. Uh, not far from here in Jerusalem, there is the Israeli Armored, armored Corps Museum. And they have, thanks to our wars uh, with the uh, Arabs uh, and so on, who were supplied by the Soviets, mm. Western and Soviet tanks side by side. And you can see the difference, okay? The, uh, so, uh, the in comparison with the Soviet and German tanks, the, the Americans uh, always look like toys, always look like toys. One reason for that is because every single Western tank had to be transported across the ocean. Okay, so they couldn't really build heavy tanks mm. uh, in comparison with the German ones. Uh, the Russians, the Soviets did not really use the Soviet, the, 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 the Western tanks, except for training purposes. They were also tended to be rather delicate. Israel, for example, back in 1968, did not buy uh, English, British chieftain uh, tanks. They were too delicate. Mm. They were built for the terrain of Western Europe and not for the Golan Belt with its basalt rocks. Okay, so. Uh, you can, it's difficult to, uh, very, it's easy to read figures maybe, but even the figures are not simple. But it's difficult to say, maybe the really decisive point is that most of this uh, aid by the West only started to see uh, arising more or less around the time of Stalingrad. So when the decision was either being or about to be, uh, to, to be made. It's interesting to get some more information on that. I got the impression from what you said earlier that it wasn't really very important. And in the context of what you said there about Germany's attack on Russia being unlike anything in history before or since, and the Western Lend Lease not being very important, really, it's Stalin who's the decisive factor in the response. Now, yes. given that, yeah, given the uh, the military, I suppose, flair and supremacy that he showed there. With World War II over, why do you think he allowed the Cold War to develop? Well, if you had asked him, he would say, I didn't. The Americans did. Okay? The Americans did. The Americans, as Lenin had specifically foreseen before he died, the Americans and the Western capitalist world in particular were determined to do everything they could to make sure that we uh, should not expand and, if possible, to roll us back. Uh, this expression of back, uh, rolling back was born during the war itself. Okay, So they never really tried to accommodate us. They never really recognized our efforts and our uh, contribution to the victory. They were determined not to allow us the the, 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 the cordon sanitaire, the uh, territories in Eastern Europe that we needed in order to make sure that the Germans would not again uh, attack us. So it was not us, he would say, it was the West with Truman at its head, a famous code warrior, he who had said explicitly that he would have liked nothing better than us, than the Germans uh, tearing each other to pieces, okay, uh, who started the Cold War. And this man, this rabid anti-communist, was in possession of the world's first and only nuclear weapons. Okay, and not only did he possess them, he used them. Okay, and not only he did he use them, he used them at a time when the war had already been a tool, was already a tool, was over the war against Japan. Okay, at the time uh, Roosevelt, sorry, Stalin, uh, sorry, Truman got the bomb and dropped it. Peace negotiations with Japan were already going on in Moscow. And to this day, there are some 
American historians who believe that the real uh, uh, ground, the real reason why Truman dropped the bombs was not to finish off Japan, which was finish off in any case, but to impress the Stalin and the Soviet Union. Hmm. So he killed maybe about 200,000 people just to impress Stalin. Democratic, liberal, God-fearing uh, Harry Truman. Now, I'm not saying that I quite completely share this view, but you cannot deny it. And it is, up to a point at least, understandable. Tell me a bit more about the clash between the so-called liberal democracies and then the, the final goal of communism as internationalism. Because thinking about Stalin's intellectual roots in Marx and Engels, they didn't view or value all nations equally. They drew a line between the nations that represent progress and modernity and those that represented, in their view, barbarism or reaction. So they were quite happy to support the nations they thought represented progress, because in their view, the the final goal of history is internationalism. And for that to triumph, it needed support. And Stalin saw that Russian culture was superior to the other national cultures in the Tsarist Empire, and he was quite happy to assimilate Um, non-Russian cultures into Russia, as long as it's a progression on the path to what he regarded as modernity and eventually global socialism, communism. Now, do you think that as the final goal explains some of the hostility of the Cold War? Is that what the Americans really fear, Stalin expanding? Well, it certainly does a lot to explain the very, very basic hostility of the West towards the Soviet Union, okay? And the other way around. Uh, it was a struggle, but as, as, as a Marxist would see it, between two world systems, two ways of understanding history, two and where it led, two ways of life, to social economic structures, everything, everything. Uh, And of course, uh, Stalin did what he could to use uh, the nationalism of uh, colonialist countries uh, in his own favor and uh, did so quite systematically and his successors were going to do that even more systematically after his death to use those those rebellions, uh, anti-colonialist rebellions against uh, against the West for their own uh, purposes. In this uh, respect, they were not so very different from any other power throughout history. Uh, so no, I'm a great admirer of Machiavelli. Machiavelli is the great authority on politics. And what at least I have learned from Machiavelli is that this age never changed. Okay. These things never change. They always, always, always remain the same. And it was true for uh, Stalin as well. He used what you might almost call the normal tools, all the normal tools of, of, of statesmanship, uh, politics, and espionage, and threat, and so on, and war when necessary, as all. Uh, statesmen, or almost all statesmen who had the power have done throughout history and presumably will go on doing uh, as long as, the, as, as history exists. Ultimately, one of his skills that contributed to his success was knowledge of and understanding of human nature as well and the ability to manipulate it. Yes, but you know, reading Stalin, I cannot recall coming across that expression, human nature. Mm. Because after all, he was a Marxist and his basic assumption was that human nature is shaped by socioeconomic factors. Mm. And so uh, for him, it was a question of history with a very capital H, understanding where history was going and then catching a ride on it, catching a ride on it. Human nature, I think, had very little, at least in this published work uh, that I've seen, played very, very little role, 
need. That's an interesting tension in that the concept of human nature is alien to Marx. In fact, it can be reshaped according to the desires of the revolutionaries. So on the one hand, very good at manipulating it, but on the other hand, they don't really believe in it. Now, the framing of the Cold War as the West versus Russia is an interesting one because thinking about the influence of Marx and Engels and others on Stalin, you could make the argument that he's actually influenced more by Western revolutionary traditions than he is by any specifically native Russian philosophical or political ideas, whether it's statism, the bureaucratic centralism, or mobilizing society for regime-defined goals. Stalin, in some sense, is a man of the modern West, isn't he? The revolutionary tradition of Marx and Lenin, mainly German thinkers, those are Stalin's main influences. Yes. Uh, I would put it a bit differently. He was a tribal chieftain from Georgia, okay? And in many ways, very backward, okay? Who found himself, maybe who knows to his own surprise, at the uh, head of a Western, a Westernizing society. Mm. So it was the politics of Georgia in charge of the modern democratic and increasingly democratic and industrial state. And it was this combination, okay, of you might call it his personal uh, attitudes as shaped by his uh, Georgian homeland and uh, modern industry, modern military, modern bureaucracy, modern ideology that really did the trick and that made him so unique. And there's a, a warning in that, isn't there? If the combination of Marxism and Jacobinism with Stalin's own personal character traits is what made him so dangerous, then at least part of that in his origins is in our origins too. You can place Stalin within the context of the Western Enlightenment political tradition. Well, he would say that, I suppose he would say that, yes, he wanted to westernize in the sense of setting up a modern, heavily industrialized, well-governed, well-ordered uh, community, but not in the sense of freedom and liberality and so on, and democracy and so on, so on. at least not Western democracy, which uh, I think that uh, if you had asked him what he thought about Western democracy, he would have said, oh, it's a joke, it's not democracy at all. It's a puppet theater mounted by the uh, only capital owning classes uh, on behalf of the capital owning classes, or as Marx put it, uh, government is just a committee uh, working on behalf of the entire bourgeoisie. Mm. Last thing they wanted. And you know, if you look at figures today, like Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos and so on and so on, you wonder, <laughs> not to mention Putin's oligarchs, but he at least has them firmly under control. I mean, no oligarch can survive Putin's eye. <laughs> that has become, <laughs> they become obvious some, some years ago. So uh, to say that I'm a great admirer of the capitalist system as we saw it, as we see it today, uh, no, I'm not. Who is? How do you think history is likely to judge Stalin? Uh, perhaps I would answer in a few words. A terrible man, but then again, no. If you look at his private life, in many ways, he was not that terrible, but let's say a terrible man in charge of a backward country uh, in against obstacles that only he could have mastered. I cannot imagine anyone else doing it, not even Hitler. Hitler did not have the sustained working ability of studying. 
okay? He gave rise probably to greater and more, more, more genuine enthusiasm, but he did not have the sheer sustained working ability of, uh, of Stalin. This has been really fascinating. I will put the link to your book, I, Stalin, into the video description. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you for a very, very interesting uh, discussion. You're welcome. Hope uh, to speak to you again. Yes. Uh, I had an idea if you're willing to, to hear it. Yes, I would love to. You got into trouble, at least so understood, because you uh, quoted my books, a book on the privileged text. <laughs> Yours was the yours was the quotation that caused the most trouble. Yes, <laughs> let's do something about that sometime when you have the opportunity. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, why not? Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Take care. Find you. At least they'll have a reason for doing so. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay.